Tonight, high-profile acquittal. I've sort of grown up with this case, really, so that's part of why it was so fascinating to see. Dennis Holland is not guilty in the death of his father, Richard. So eight years after a homicide, what will investigators do? Just want to take advantage of this wonderful weather. For millions of Canadians, it's hot and it's going to get hotter. Call it a heat wave or a heat dome. We're looking at how you're dealing. Where go, same time, where go. It was all um, painstakingly put from photographs. And Apollo 11's mission control, reconstructed by a Canadian, right down to the coffee cups. We'll take you inside 50 years after the historic moon landing. This is The National. Dennis Oland is a free man, and a New Brunswick judge found him not guilty today of the murder of his multi-millionaire father. Richard Oland was the head of a family that owns Moosehead Breweries, among other things. The father's brutal death has long divided the community. Every step in his son's case followed closely by New Brunswickers for eight years. In 2011, Richard Oland was found bludgeoned to death in his St. John office. In 2013, his son Dennis was arrested. Prosecutors said he was the last person to see Richard alive. Two years later, Dennis Oland was found guilty of second-degree murder. But then an appeals court overturned the verdict, saying the judge didn't properly instruct the jury. In 2018, the retrial began, this time before a judge alone. From the start, Dennis Oland insisted he had nothing to do with his father's death. It is clear that plenty of people, including the judge, had doubts. But as Kayla Hounsell tells us, that was not enough for a guilty verdict. Dennis Olin was greeted with applause when he left the courtroom a free man. He declined to speak, but his lawyer had plenty to say. And I hope that everybody in St. John now understands and appreciates that Dennis Olin did not kill his father and understands the misery that he and his family and his friends and supporters have gone through through the last eight years. In this community, the Olin name carries a lot of weight. I think that many people in St. John felt a personal connection, even though we don't have a personal connection to it. Dozens lined up outside the courtroom for two hours to ensure they would get a seat for the long-awaited decision. There were gasps when it was read. Alex Hoyt was among them. He's a McGill Law student from St. John. I've sort of grown up with this case, really, so that's part of why it was so fascinating to see. And opinion is still divided now that Oland has been declared not guilty. It doesn't surprise me in the least. Money buys freedom. I'm kind of surprised. I feel very much for Dennis Olin. I think he's been through a tremendous amount. In court, the judge said there is much to implicate Dennis Oland in the murder of his father. The Crown argued money was the motive, producing evidence of Olin's soaring debts. But the judge wasn't satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense argued the police had tunnel vision. We all sincerely hope, and the Olin family sincerely hopes, that the St. John police force will finally reinvigorate the investigation and start doing the investigation that should have been done eight years ago to find the real perpetrators of this terrible, terrible crime. The defense also emphasized this remains a family tragedy. I'm a little uncomfortable with people coming up and saying congratulations as if this was some day to celebrate because it's important to bear in mind that Dennis lost his dad to a brutal murder. The Crown says it hasn't decided whether it will appeal the ruling. As for Oland, his lawyer says he should be afforded privacy, time he'll need to convince himself his odyssey with the justice system is finally over. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, St. John. Investigators have faced a lot of criticism for their handling of the Olin case. They're staying tight-lipped tonight. Chief Bruce Connell released a statement saying only the St. John Police Force respects the decision of Mr. Justice Morrison. Oh, Rosie, you're tracking a potentially deadly heat wave in the United States. Yeah, you bet, Ian. There's uh, millions of Canadians already feeling it today and this weekend, too.
More than 195 million people in the U.S. are under heat advisories, watches, or warnings, with temperatures in some places expected to top 40 degrees over the next few days. It was so hot in Nebraska today, these biscuits were baked on a dashboard. And over in New York, the mayor declared a local state of emergency. Take this weather seriously. We have not seen temperatures like this in at least seven years. Major events have been called off and cooling centers set up. Here in Canada, heat warnings are in effect for much of southern Ontario, Quebec and parts of the Maritimes. In Toronto this weekend, it could feel like 43 and forecasters say severe thunderstorms are building. And in Montreal, it could feel even hotter than that, up to 45 degrees on the Humidex. Sarah Levitt has more on how people are coping there. As temperatures soar, these kids are staying cool. With a heat warning in effect in Montreal, the hot, wet air has many seeking relief. At the newly opened Verdun Beach on the shore of the St. Lawrence River, the water's refreshing. This weekend, temperatures are expected to reach more than 40 degrees with the Humidex. According to the city, not a heat wave yet, but officials are still cautioning people find a cool area. We know that drinking water regularly and, and taking time uh, out of the heat is important. It's I mean, just medically, physiologically, it makes sense. If people aren't uh, in hot environments for days at a time, they won't have those severe impacts. With recent memories of minus 20 temperatures and snow piled high, some Montrealers say no one should be complaining. We are live in a country with the extreme, so we need to uh, learn to enjoy it. It took a lot of time for summer to get here, so just want to take advantage of this wonderful weather. Not everyone heeds advice to avoid strenuous outdoor activities. These cyclists say riding their bikes is actually helping them get cool. Biking, it's fresh. I mean, uh, it's uh, we're, we're next to the water too, so it's, uh, it's good. Others say this heat isn't even that bad. We're from North Carolina, so it could be much worse. Come visit us and we'll show you really, really hot. Still for many in Montreal, seeking any type of cool relief is the ideal way to beat the heat. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Now, Montreal says it's much better repaired this year than last year when extreme heat was linked to 66 deaths. But this sweltering air extends from Montreal to Miami, just sitting there broiling a huge part of the continent. Some call the phenomenon a heat wave. Others call it a heat dome. Here's how it works. Whatever you want to call it, heat like this behaves in ways well known to meteorologists. I sometimes think a lid off a frying pan. The sun comes in, bakes those temperatures at the ground, that air rises, but the lid kind of compresses the air and it sinks to the ground. It warms up even more. The lid is actually high pressure atmospheric conditions that not only push heat down, but also make it difficult for other weather systems to come in. That's why heat waves linger for days or weeks. These waves aren't only defined by sweltering afternoons, but also hotter than normal overnight lows when our bodies usually adjust. We find that people are more adversely affected when you have a couple of days of hot weather combined with really hot, sticky overnight temperatures as well. What qualifies as a heat wave varies though, depending on the location and what residents are used to. In Toronto, it needs to hit at least 31 degrees and get no lower than 20 for two straight days. St. John's, 28 plus, no lower than 16. Saskatoon, it needs to hit 32 and keep above 16 unless you get two straight days of 38 degrees. Nunavut's heat warning system is a work in progress, but in the territory's north, it hit 21 degrees this week. And if that isn't a heat wave, it probably should be. The average temperature in July there is about seven degrees. The system might actually affect more northern areas than it used to affect before. Heat waves could also last longer because as climate change heats up the north, it slows down the jet stream, a band of air that pushes and pulls weather systems. In the future, it's going to be hotter and worse, and we do need to prepare ourselves. So stay exposed to that heat, and there is a point where people just can't cope anymore. Christine Birak charts the impact of high temperatures on the body. This sticky, sweltering heat can be overwhelming and dangerous. I've definitely been tired. I felt um, really drained, felt uh, 
not even sweating anymore because I'm overheated, um, felt dizzy. Our bodies start shutting down when our core temperature rises above 37 degrees Celsius. During the day, the key is to chill out. But even if you're healthy and fit, nighttime heat can affect whether your body's core temperature actually drops. On muggy nights, the issue is not just the temperature, but it's the humidity. And that affects our body's ability to evaporate our sweat off of our body. And so we retain that heat as we're lying there overnight. And in fact, that's the reason why a lot of heat-related deaths take place through the overnight. When heat and humidity spike at night, it's important to spot the signs of heat stress. It's the symptom progression that we're really looking at along with the body temperature. Heat emergencies can have three stages, starting with heat cramps, headache, dizziness and nausea. Heat exhaustion piles on heavy sweating, muscle cramps and fainting. These symptoms can all be treated with shade, water and a cool shower. But left unchecked, the body's temperature can hit 40 degrees. That's heat stroke. No more sweating, behavioral changes or confusion sets in, along with spasms or seizures. This is an emergency. Our lungs can have fluid on them, what we call pulmonary edema. The ability for our blood to clot normally is affected. So really there's multiple organs that are affected when temperature rises so high. Young children and the elderly need extra care. Their bodies have a harder time sweating and regulating their core temperature. Recognizing heat sickness and acting quickly can be life-saving. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. There have already been deaths linked to heat over the past week, two in Manitoba. A reminder that those heat warnings are really about saving lives. Donald Trump changed his tune today. He had been critical of his supporters for chanting, send her back at a rally Wednesday night. But today he applauded them and refocused his attack on the woman they were talking about, Democratic Congresswoman Ilan Omar. Criticizing her plays to his base, even when, as Katie Simpson shows us, some specific accusations are unsupported by the facts. A defiant Donald Trump is walking back his criticism of supporters who chanted, send her back. Those are incredible people. Those are incredible patriots. The change in tone comes after Ilhan Omar, one of four congresswomen under attack by the president, was showered in support when she arrived home in Minnesota last night. Of the rookie lawmakers Trump has targeted, Omar has faced the harshest criticism. They can't talk about evil Jews, which is what they say, evil Jews. There's no record of her saying that, though she has apologized for anti-Israel comments in the past, including this tweet from 2012, when she called for people to, quote, see the evil doings of Israel. In February, she apologized again after suggesting pro-Israel members of Congress are all about the Benjamins, or, in other words, money. Well, there's a lot of talk about the fact that she was married to a brother. I know nothing about it. There are no facts to substantiate the claim Omar married her brother to commit immigration fraud. Fox News has amplified the allegation that emerged on right-wing blogs in 2016. And then there's this. I hear the way she talks about al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda has killed many Americans. She said you can hold your chest out. You Trump suggests Omar is an al-Qaeda sympathizer, pointing to comments from 2013 where she describes the odd way one of her professors pronounced the names of terror groups. Every time the, the, the professor said al-Qaeda, he sort of like his shoulders went up and, you know, yeah, he's in command like, here. al-Qaeda, you know, has been he's an expert. <laughs> In no way does Omar say anything positive about terrorists. Omar is a self-described progressive, and before these attacks, Democratic leaders had tried to distance themselves from her views. But now the party is trying to strike a balance between defending her and not offending moderate voters. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. In the Strait of Hormuz, where about a third of the world's oil by sea passes every day, another step perhaps towards conflict after Iran boarded two vessels. The Stena Impero was commandeered and taken into Iranian waters along with its 23 crew, according to Iran, because it violated maritime regulations. Iran also boarded a second Liberian flagged British managed vessel. But it was reportedly later released. Both Britain and the United States warned Iran of consequences. This only goes to show what I'm saying about Iran. 
trouble, nothing but trouble. The trouble in the Persian Gulf has been growing steadily since May. Iran has been accused of sabotaging six vessels and has shot down a U.S. drone. While earlier this month, Britain seized an Iranian supertanker, and the U.S. claims one of its warships was uh, shot down an Iranian drone yesterday. The U.S. military says it stepped up air patrols of the region. The bodies of three men have now been recovered from the wreckage of that float plane that crashed in Labrador this week. A 47-year-old fishing guide from Newfoundland and Labrador and two American men in their 60s. The group was traveling from a fishing cabin at Crossroads Lake near the Quebec border and crashed in the Mistaston Lake on Monday. Four men are still missing and at this stage they are presumed dead, two Canadians and two Americans. And tonight, confirmation of another fatal plane crash in Alaska. State troopers say a beaver float plane crashed near Tutka Bay this morning on its way to Anchorage. Seven people were on board. One man was killed. A child is in critical condition tonight. The passengers, all visitors from the U.S. state of Maryland. We've got a lot more still ahead tonight, including the movie trailer that's got a lot of people scratching their heads today. What is going on with the new star-studded Cats movie? But first... All this looks like it might be put here haphazardly, but it was all uh, painstakingly put from photographs of what document was there, open on what page, uh, and it's really just very emo moving uh, and emotional experience, I think, to be here. We'll visit Apollo Mission Control as it was 50 years ago with the Canadian who helped piece it all together. Tomorrow will represent 50 years from the time we planted a beautiful American flag on the moon. We're going to be doing the Space Force. I assume you guys are all in favor of the Space Force, right? I'd be very surprised if you weren't, but that's where it's at. President Trump reminding us of his plans to militarize space today while marking the Apollo 11 mission, along with astronauts Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, and the family of Neil Armstrong, if they support the Space Force, they didn't say. We've also been marking the moon landing all week on the National, a powerful symbol of what can be done when people work together. Over the decades, key artifacts of the achievement were in danger of being lost to time and to decay until a Canadian stepped in. Our Eli Glasner explains. You guys can come on in. Days before the official opening, we're stepping into the room that helped make history. Our tour guide is an unassuming software engineer from Toronto, Ben Feist. Well, honestly, it's, uh, it's really surreal to be here. I mean, you, you, see, you see all this stuff. To understand how Feist found himself in Mission Control, we need to go back to his basement, where his obsession started. This is Apollo 11 in real time. For years, Feist spent his time documenting moon missions on the websites he built. Then he discovered the mother load. I can see everything quite clearly. 11,000 hours of mission control voices from Apollo 11. But it was in rough shape. And it turns out that when you have old machines and old tapes, then you play them back. It's amazing that you're able to play them back at all. Capcom, we're go for landing. All the men of mission control, the flight controllers, the surgeons, even the astronauts, were mixed into a muddy mess with no consistent sense of time. Houston had a problem. If you want to try to figure out what somebody was talking about at a given time in the mission, you need to be able to jump to that time. Right. And so that was really the problem that, um, that I went out to try to solve. As he analyzed the audio, Feist discovered a tone that functioned as a timeline. And you can hear it's wavering. And wrote a program to match the voices to the tone, making the recordings consistent and clear. The fact that it worked uh, was just <laughs> This eureka moment, I couldn't believe. Where go, same time, where go. It was the breakthrough NASA needed. These tapes may never have seen the, the light of day again. Mm -hmm. um, and having them come back to life, it's almost like having a window open into history. Hello? Hello. As Feist listened to the voices of a controller razzing someone for sleeping in. Afternoon. Yeah, man, you didn't miss lunch. Or breathing a sigh of relief after the moon landing. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. They're just normal people uh, doing a job. And they're young. They're, I think the average age was 26 years old in Mission Control. They're professional. Um, but they're also, you know, complaining about how much overtime they're working. 
But as Feist was working to restore the audio, another recovery effort was underway. For years, the original mission control had fallen into disrepair. Just in time for the anniversary, everything from the carpets to computer consoles were being restored to bring tourists back to 1969. Okay, and what better way to tell the story of mission control than with the audio itself? It's one of the reasons of when Feist visited NASA to present his website, they invited him on board. I believe the, the, uh, the first thing that was said was, it's really complicated to explain who you are. It would be easier if you just worked here. Uh, <laughs> Altitude 5,200 feet. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Right up. Go. Right. go. Now tourists can watch and listen from the actual viewing lounge as the mission control audio brings Apollo 11's most dramatic moments back to life. Uh, go ahead, Mr. President. This is Houston now. And they, they were like, yeah, that's cool. What's with the map? And they all ran up to the map. Okay, so that was For the moon maps Feist's describing, he recruited another Canadian, multimedia producer Tyler Straw. People get emotional, and that's pretty wonderful for me to have given them that sort of experience. Okay, keep the chatter down. After all those years of listening to their voices, Feist is standing in the room responsible for this. That's one small step for man. All this looks like it might be put here haphazardly, but it was all um, painstakingly put from photographs of what document was there, open on what page, uh, and it's really just very emo moving uh, and emotional experience, I think, to be here. Why, why, why do you say it's emotional? Uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know, in a lot of ways, Apollo, it helped us define what it is to be human. It was us at our very best doing something that was extremely difficult. And, you know, those people were, they might be personally flawed, but they were perfect in that moment. Today our calling to explore is even greater. With history preserved, NASA's looking forward. We're going. We are going. The new goal? Have the first woman on the moon by 2024. And Feist will be part of it, building systems to share it with the world. Yeah, if, if I have my way, the, the eight-year-old at home watching uh, the next moon mission will be using the same system that Mission Control uses to to manage that same mission with full openness of all the channels of data and, and uh, video and, and as a new way to capture the imagination of, uh, of kids. Part of the first few steps to NASA's next giant leap. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Houston. And Eli will be back after the break to talk space with Andrew, astronaut Dave Williams, and a space engineering student. They'll explore the lasting legacy of Apollo 11. Plus. It's so easy to leave. Yeah, so the internet has a lot of questions. I have questions. You have a lot of feelings about this new Cats trailer, so that is still ahead. Okay, so by now you've probably seen this shot a few times. The beginnings of that milestone mission to the moon. No one really disputes that it was a defining moment, unequaled in its ambition and its audacity. But the impact, easy to take for granted. In the 50 years that followed those small steps and giant leaps, we have technology that would have made Neil Armstrong's head spin. Explore's been hit. Explore, do you read? Movies and pop culture that maybe tell us more about ourselves than anything actually out there. Dave, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? And ambitions? Well, there's no limit. I watched on television the ex exploits of those astronauts walking on the surface of the moon, and that culminated my dream to becoming, wanting to become an astronaut. It was scientists coming together and make something incredible happen over many, many years. It's a reminder of what we can do. Uh, and I, when I say we, I mean like the biggest we you can imagine, humanity. So, three people who've given a lot of thought to what Apollo 11 did for humankind. My name's Dave Williams, Canadian astronaut and veteran of two space shuttle flights. 
You're an astronaut. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm but a... you're a robotics engineer. That's yeah, so cool. Well. I'm Sogan Talebi, fourth-year space engineering student from York University. I don't know if you're a Star Trek oh, yeah. fan, but uh -huh. I mean, uh, I think I've, I've heard you're a bigger fan than me. I'm Eli Glasner. I'm an entertainment reporter, film critic, and a self-avowed space geek. Okay, so what I want to try to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is to try to unpack this idea of, you know, what it is we should all be taking away from the fact that something like the moon landing happened. I mean, half a century ago, and, and, and let's tease apart what kind of a course change that represented for humanity. And Dave, I, I want to start with you, because from a sort of science and, and technological standpoint, I mean, what did that moon landing set in motion for humanity? Well, first of all, the lunar landing transformed the way we think of our own planet and launched the environmental movement. But to get to the moon, those requirements basically led us to developing a whole generation of new technologies. Imagine the computing power that was required to send the spacecraft to the moon, land successfully, and then come back. And of course, during the landing of the Apollo 11 capsule, they had a computer error message, you know, based on the computers of those time. So that launched the whole generation of computing platforms that we have today, our smartphones in our pockets, are an evolution of the technology that was developed for Apollo. So again, how, how did you first become interested in, in the, the, the space of the space. space of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just um, when, since I was a little kid, my parents would read me from astronomy magazines instead of like normal bedtime stories. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't nursery rhymes. Or no, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. it's, but, but it was cool, you know? It yeah. was like a whole other world. And um, they told me about different planets, and it was basically like, oh, they're, you, they're different planets like Earth, but you can't really live on them. You might die because you have no oxygen. And I said, what's an oxygen? I'm like five years old. <laughs> right. uh, but that kind of got me interested into it. And then later on, I did a like, bunch of robotics with this organization, First Robotics. And I said, OK, I want to be in the engineering si side of things. Right. But also astronauts are either medical professionals or in the military or engineers. Majority of them. Right. And, and so what's, then I what... chose engineering. OK, but, but what's the dream? Like, I feel like after the age of 20, you can't really say you want to become an astronaut anymore. You can, but it's a you're little bit. You're supposed to have outgrown you're that. You're supposed ambition. to say, <laughs> you know, I would like to aid in space exploration. <laughs> I see. But if you want to put me on a rocket, I'm all good. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you had a recent experience mm -hmm. where you got to see another side. I mean, you, you were studying space, space law. Law. Yes. Okay. It was. It was for um, European Space Agency has outreach things that they do. And um, space law is a big part of it, as uh, he, you might know. Yeah. Sorry, an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> You're excited about this. I, I, but, um, it's a bigger other side of things that we don't see. Because with this space exploration, it's not just about the scientist you know, or um, working hard to make it happen. It's a big part of it is politics. You know, lawyers making it work between different nations and how it's going to work out. So, it does take many, many people working together and coming together to make a space uh, flight or any space exploration happen. And space law looks into that. Right. Eli, I don't remember as a kid reading a whole lot of books or seeing movies about space lawyers. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> that would be a failed show. <laughs> well, yeah, space and... lawyer, I present you this summons, Saturn. Like, what? No. Well, like... yeah, and, and, but I mean, mo I mean, most of our touch points with space, yeah. I mean, through our lives, have been things like, like Star Trek and Star Wars and Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. I think so far in pop culture, we think of those pilots, we think of those men, you know, gripping the joystick and gritting their teeth and piloting their craft and smashing through the atmosphere. And, and it seems like it's just like an act of will. Like it's just yeah. because they were strong enough and brave enough and gosh darn it, like they did it. It's Han Solo, you know, in the Millennium Falcon. It's, it's, it's in Guardians of the Galaxy with Star-Lord and all of that. But and a raccoon, obviously. And a raccoon. <laughs> raccoon <laughs> has to be a there. Raccoon. Well, Toronto has a lot of them, so maybe we have an yeah. advantage We can empathize. You yeah. never know. I mean, there, there aren't shows that capture necessarily that spirit of cooperation. It's right. interesting. I was recently uh, in Houston, uh, and they're talking about the next moon mission, the Artemis program. And they're talking about the spirit of international cooperation and all the various companies and countries that are going to be working together. That's not a sexy movie, right? That's not our way of telling the story of space, except 
and you're a fan, I think Star Trek. Star Trek is one of the few examples I just of... I bright enough. Hugh there you go. Enough. But I mean, because it was, okay, this kind of utopian, how would we work together, not just us, but other species? So we talk about going from science fiction to science fact, and arguably what we saw in Star Trek back in the 60s with all these different cultures coming together on a spacecraft, we're living that on the space station every day now. Yeah. And that will be the future of space exploration, is people from all over the world coming together to explore on the behalf of humanity. But, so, so that's a really interesting point. I mean, the, this idea that what? I mean, space exploration drove all of this creativity, sure. right? This yeah. idea that, that you could push the limits well beyond the sky, right? But what are you saying? That, that those works, that ambition, those dreams actually turned into something real, that, it, that the cycle, it, it sped itself. There's actually, there's no question about that. You think of the technologies that are portrayed in Star Trek, and you think about the tricorder, and you look at our smartphones that we have today and the capability that we have through those devices. In, when I was in university, I was taught that it's impossible to map the human genome. We've done that, and we're doing gene sequencing in space. So I say get rid of the letters I am out of the word impossible. It's about making the impossible possible from science fiction to science fact and looking forward at the next 50 years. It's going to be incredible. And you need, you need to dream it. Like, you need to explore those ideas first before you can actually do them. And I think right. that's what you can do in a, in a TV show or in movies. You look at a film like Interstellar from a few years ago, where these like amazing out of this world sequences bending uh, space and time and gravity. Like you can debate exactly what's happening and how achievable that is, but they're starting the process. They're saying, what if, what if, what if, and then maybe this and maybe that. And then down the road, someone goes, yeah, Okay, maybe, and, and you know, and we don't know. But but here's what I sometimes wonder about, uh, you know, whether it just kind of goes to show you how little we all actually understand about the very serious business of space exploration. But, but here's the thing, though. I feel like with space, with many other things, the more it's kind of like Pandora's box. The more you open, the more you realize how much more we have to explore. I mean, it wasn't many years ago when we didn't know there were other galaxies. You know, you know, and it opens up so many different worlds and universes when you start kind of learning more and more. But Dave, it, it doesn't bother you that, that most people's touch point with what you have devoted your life to is laser beams and, and pew pew and you know warp drives, <laughs> that sort of thing? I think it's exciting because it captures our imagination. And it's all about capturing your imagination and translating those ideas into proposals for new technologies that will help us go farther into space. Right. You know, you think about time in the context of exploring our solar system, going to the moon, three days. The missions last, you know, days to weeks. Going to Mars, it's gonna be a totally different scenario. Six months to get there and the mission overall will be three year mission. Going far in our solar system, unless we have a new generation of spacecraft, it's going to take a huge amount of time. But, but let, me, let me just push you on one thing, because I, I wonder if we need to do a better job of, of, of informing people or having people understand exactly what it is that's actually going up there. Does the Canadian Space Agency and NASA, NASA have to do a better job of, of being transparent? About yeah. that sort of stuff. I think we all have to do a better job of sharing the excitement, the passion for space. The technologies we use in space, for instance, the Canadarm on the space station, has been modified to create NeuroArm, a neurosurgical robot that enables neurosurgeons to perform precision procedures. And what we do to support humans in space with these new technologies enables them to stay longer and to go farther. And those technologies for space will help us back here on Earth. And you think about where we're at today from a technological perspective compared to 50 years ago, imagine where we're going to be 50 years from now when we have humans living and working on the surface of Mars and it's routine to see humans on another planet in our solar system. I want to ask all of you one last question, the same question, and that's simply, what excites you most when you look forward to not the last 50 years, but the next 50 years? So again, maybe I'll start with you. I want to make sure that I also play a part in the next 50 years. I want to make sure that I'm pretty sure there are many scientists and many engineers looking up at the moon landing and they said, you know what, I wrote like one line of code for that. I want to look at the next, you know, big thing and say, I did something and I was part of it. You want to be able to say mission successful. Yeah, mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are. I mean, there's a reason why when Hollywood's trying to capture attention, 
they look to the stars, right? And we have new movies on the way with Brad Pitt and Natalie Portman and more because it is one of those like amazing feats filled with awe. I want and I'm excited to look forward to a day when we're all paying attention to not science fiction but something like that where again the world stops as we wait to see that woman take the first step on the moon and everyone will be looking at their screens big and small and it will be because we came together humanity cooperated the best of our instincts and intentions and pulled that off and got back there and then maybe beyond i mean that's that's more than spectacle like that is that is a, an amazing moment and i if i can witness that with my like i'm used to reliving these things <laughs> as movies and shows, but to actually experience that, I, I don't even know what I would feel. Dave, you get the last word. So 50 years ago, I was told that my dream of becoming an astronaut was impossible. I had a chance to ride on the Canada Arm with a Canadian flag on my shoulder helping build the space station. So my dream is for the next generation, for Canada to continue to grow as a major spacefaring nation. And thinking about somewhere in Canada right now, there might be a seven-year-old growing up dreaming of becoming that next generation Canadian astronaut. Or a 22-year-old. <laughs> that will one day walk on Mars, that will invent the next generation of robots. So we're going to be using in space and that is really exciting to continue the evolution of what we started 50 years ago and think about where we're going to be 50 years from now. Eli, Dave, so again, thanks so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Ahead tonight, it was a gamble but it really paid off for a couple of newlyweds. We'll explain a little later. Uh, first, though, a look at an interview you will see here on Sunday night. This weekend marks one year since a gunman opened fire on the Danforth in Toronto. Two people were killed, 13 injured, including Daniel Kane. She recently sat down with Andrew to talk about that night, a chance encounter that took her back to where it all happened and finding strength after the horror. Have you been back to the Danforth? Have you have On St. Patrick's Day, we... Uh, we were kind of partying with friends at a pub, like uh, it was a good paying day and um, you know we had a few drinks at a pub and we were going home dropping people off uh, and we had just happened to pass by the Danforth just to see again um, how close uh, the shooter was to me, like just how, how narrow that street is. Uh, I'm again reminded of you know, how lucky I am to be alive because uh, I couldn't have been closer, could not have been closer to him, so. That was the only time you've been back? That was the only time I've been back. And uh, yeah, so it was, it, it was surprising to me. I thought I might feel afraid, but um, instead I feel stronger. I'm like, you know, that's, I came from there and I was broken and I was like, bleeding and broken there and now I've been put together and I'm on the the path to recovery so Here's what else we're following tonight. More bad news for Ontario's auto sector. About 200 jobs will be cut from Ford's Oakville plant beginning in September. The automaker says that is due to slowing sales of the Ford Flex and the Lincoln MKT. The union local president says there may be more cuts in January. and He's calling on the provincial and federal governments to do more for the industry. We're slowly eroding away and, uh, and we, we need help. There's no doubt about it. Back in November, General Motors announced it would stop making cars at its Oshawa plant by the end of this year. The son of an Australian police inspector is one of two people found dead in northern British Columbia. Lucas Fowler and his American girlfriend, China Deese, were killed either Sunday or Monday of this week. Their bodies discovered Monday night by RCMP officers on the Alaska Highway south of the popular Liard Hot Springs. Australian police say they believe the couple was shot. Investigators are asking for anyone who may have seen a blue minivan found nearby to come forward. And an unusual sight in Alberta today, a repl replica of a huge World War II bomb making its way down the highway just south of Calgary. The bomb is nicknamed the Grand Slam, the largest in the war at 10,000 kilograms. 
The replica took three months to build. It's eight meters long, and it's headed to the Canadian Bomber Command Museum, which I can tell you is already worth the visit. Usually when a big movie, big budget movie in particular, drops, the internet sort of erupts in excitement or skepticism when they see that trailer. But when the official trailer for Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cats came out this week, the collective online response was something closer to eh, mildly horrified confusion. I'm your face to the So why is the internet so worked up? Well, the physical proportions of the cats are kind of all over the place. Are they cat sized? Are they people sized? Also, the ears and faces are a little, I don't know, like there's something off there. And even some of their movements are a little, uh, yeah, I just, I don't know, eerie, I want to say. So many questions. So we sent our Stephanie Mercier out to see what else people are saying about all this cats business. It's really creepy. If you haven't seen it yet, she's talking about this. The trailer dropped yesterday and got a lot of online hate. Dear God, what were they thinking? I mean, you, you, that's the response. This film critic says the trailer stormed the internet, prompting question after question. It makes very little sense. Why are the cats too small? Why are they walking upright? Why are they kind of naked? I mean, they're cats, so of course, but why are we aware that they're kind of naked? Cats is just the latest musical to get the live action big screen treatment. The Lion King just debuted with very real looking animals who also sing. And the internet has a well-documented love affair with cat videos. So why the negativity for this one? The director of an entire cat video festival thinks it's crossing a line. They call it the uncanny valley. It's this little difference between something that's a real person and something that's obviously fake. It looks too in between real and fake and people get creeped out by it. Even those who are very close to the show aren't sold on the movie. This choreographer has worked in or on a number of Cats productions. It kind of looks alien. Interesting though, it's kind of creepy cool, but it, it's not as feline as I would like it to be. But what do critics know? Many thought the original musical didn't sound too promising either, but it's been a worldwide hit for almost four decades. These new cats are already getting some love. First thoughts? It's beautiful. I'm so excited. <laughs> are you gonna go see it? Yeah, Definitely. 100%. It looks amazing. It looks like magical. I love it. There's uh, some humor in it. It looks perfect. Like it's everything I would assume it would be. Creepy to some, Perfect to others. Kind of a cat in a nutshell. That's what makes a Gumby cat. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. I loved everything about that whole story. Okay, this isn't the first time the internet, though, has freaked out about sort of questionable CGI. Just a few months ago, online uproar led to changes to the upcoming Sonic the Hedgehog movie. So for perspective, here's what Sonic looks like in the video game. So pretty short, big head, those straight stick legs. But in the movie trailer, he has more of these human-like proportions. And even worse for fans, he has human teeth. Apparently, they just creeped everyone out. And the horrified Twitter backlash was so intense, the studio promised to redesign the character to something closer to the original. Phew. Rob and Tanya Taylor got married back in the fall, but just this week, they received one big belated wedding gift and it definitely was not on the registry. Their friend asked the newlyweds to make a bit of a gamble. Now he's a professional poker player who just won big at the World Series of Poker. And let's just say their gamble paid off, paid off for the couple and for our moment. day after our wedding and we were just opening our cards and then I opened Alex's and the bottom of the card was like instead of giving you a hundred dollars um, I'm going to give you this ten dollar lottery ticket and one percent of my main event and I was just casually reading it because I don't know a whole lot about poker and my husband actually plays poker as well um, just as a hobby and he started with and he started freaking out and was like oh my god this is crazy like that's a crazy gift and I was like 
Yeah, I guess. I have Alex on social media and he was always updating us on how he was doing. And I just answered one of his Instagram stories, just wishing him luck. And he replied and he was like, don't forget, you have 1% of my winning. So when he came third, like it was just so sweet. It's so cool to just know Alex and for him to be getting all this attention. Like he's just a great guy. So I too, Rosie, don't know a lot about casinos and gambling and card games, but I was just talking to a friend last night who in a single night at a casino lost $2,000. So it is certainly not a sure thing, and it sure yeah. worked out well for that couple. Yeah, so they got $40,000 because he won $4 million, so that's 1%, and they wow. said they're going to use it because they just put in a pool, they got some patio furniture, and they're thanking their lucky stars that Alex got invited to that wedding. <laughs> And followed through on that promise. I'm impressed. Absolutely. As well. There you go. All right, that is the national for July 19th. Good night, everybody. What's the moral of the story, by the way? Good night. Just <laughs> play poker. <laughs>